Thanks for coming, everyone. Uh, it's a great turnout. Um, I'll let Michael and Peter, who I've got to the side here, come and take a seat. Um, they'll introduce themselves when they get up and talk. Um, I'll just swap my slide deck over. Do you want me to do that? So again, thanks for coming, everyone. Um, we had a talk, I'm not sure how long ago it was, but more than 12 months ago, um, by David Iwanow, who he's a very passionate um, marketer, and he's also been a driving force be, um, behind setting up the SEO meetups as a regular occurrence in Australia. Um, he's actually working in Amsterdam at the moment. Um, but it was a much smaller crowd uh, than when he came along and talked about SEO. Um, but the feedback that I got from people was, you know, wow, that's actually interesting talk. It was useful. Um, I think they were expecting, you know, people talking about, you know, bots that go out and create, you know, spammy links and that kind of thing, which um, unfortunately when it comes to SEO in the past, uh, that's been a bit of a problem. And I think we've all uh, experienced, um, if you've got a blog, uh, comment spam, you know, nice article when it's, you know, with some link to some site or... Uh, you know, $50 and we'll get you to the top of Google, that kind of thing. So um, really what we wanted to do is come, come along and, and let you guys know about options. Um, we all work uh, in uh, various sort of online uh, tech fields. Uh, we're very passionate about, um, you know, search technology in general. Um, and I'll let the guys actually introduce themselves as well. But I recognise a few of the faces from the SEO meetups, which we also um, are held regularly in South Melbourne once a month. So there's something to break the ice, um, and that's how you kind of feel when you get a number one ranking. So. But really, that's pretty accurate. Okay. Um, so the agenda is uh, an introduction to SEO. So we really wanted to make it accessible for uh, beginners. And I know by looking around that there's quite a lot of uh, professionals in the room um, who already do a bit of SEO or um, sort of work in uh, you know, similar areas. But so everybody can follow along, we do cover the basics. So if you're you know, a bit more advanced, just sort of um, hang in there with us. And we, when we start to get into part two and three, um, I'm sure that I'm positive that there will be some information uh, that you can take away, some more advanced tools and techniques. And if not, uh, part four, which we'd hope to fly through the talk so we can actually get through to questions. So if you have any questions, um, please feel free to, to ask at the end of the session. So, um, is this how you feel about SEO? I think one of the uh, common uh, pieces of feedback that I get is that it's confusing. Um, you know, my uh, you know, SEO company that I'm using is you know, it's too complicated and it bamboozles me. Um, really, SEO is you know, at the heart and a lot of the, the sort of common theme to what we'll be talking about is quality. So, if you focus on quality, you're already a big part of the way there. Um, and the acronyms, as with any sort of tech field, uh, you know, you can break it down as long as you've sort of got someone to, to sort of guide you. So the basics. Um, it's simple maths. You can only really have one number one, uh, and you can only have one first page, um, and that's why you need SEO. And I, when I, when I sort of refer to SEO, and especially uh, the meetup or conferences, they're really an umbrella for... Uh, online marketing, uh, social media, search technology. It's not all about sort of organic SEO, but um, that's what we, we're going to focus on tonight. So what does it stand for? So it stands for Search Engine Optimization. And really, this is when we talk about SEO, it's usually how do we get this to this? And I've used Anthony Horton as an example for a very, um, very average rank of three there. Um, but I actually had to look because he ranks uh, number one for a lot of the WordPress uh, manual, for example, a lot of the WordPress terms. And I think um, 
you know, there's, it's a really good uh, case study of how if you create something awesome and put your heart and soul into it, um, that you get rewards. Like the reason why Anthony does so well is because he's got a great guide and he's established himself as an authority in WordPress. So that's why we all, uh, you know, happily link to him, happily recommend him. So that's a good example. So that's the wall of text. Um, essentially, uh, this is a good definition. There is no standard, uh, you know, sort of agreed on definition. Um, this is really for the slides when we make them available because um, we'll upload them after the talk. But really it means you want your site high in the search results pages. So again, for the, sort of a basic analogy is think of the search engines as librarians or think of them as the index to where all the web pages, you're not actually searching the web when you do a search and some sort of, uh, you know, your clients, they may think that's how it works, but Google has an index of everything and there's certain ways and certain um, best practices that you can use and that's what we're going to cover today. Um, but the real sort of crux of it, and I can't sort of stress this point enough, is if you focus on users and giving users a good experience, providing quality for them, the search engines will usually reward you for that. And uh, I can think of some examples of um, some pretty successful uh, online sites that really don't do much SEO, they haven't done much SEO. Um, it's becoming a lot harder for them to be, uh, you know, maintain rankings in competitive niches, but um, if you focus on quality, usually that's enough. Uh, if you're ultra competitive um, niche, then maybe you need some, some extra help. But Google loves to give relevant results to its users. So if you keep that in mind, uh, when Google changes its algorithm updates, you're, you're then sort of safe. Um, but there are also lots of best practices and we'll provide you with some information uh, at the end of the talk to go off and learn more if you're interested. So I mentioned algorithm. Um, it's really how the search engine weighs in all the factors that goes into a search and what it's delivering and determines what pages that it's going to show for a user. So. Uh, if we go to the next one. You might have heard of things like Penguin and Panda. Has ever, anyone heard of Penguin and Panda? Yep, so, so quite a few people. Um, so these are sort of pet names or code names that uh, search professionals or Google uses to um, label their particular algorithm changes. And, you know, these sorts of things, you know, you, you do hear a lot of people saying, oh, it wiped the site out or this site got wiped out. And if you're following best practice, a lot of people were unscathed, uh, but if you're sort of at the bleeding edge, um, especially when you're talking about ultra-competitive industries, you saw, a lot of people kind of do have to um, follow, you know, bleeding edge uh, techniques. Um, but, you know, these sorts of things are really names when Google comes along and makes big changes to how they rank sites. And we'll talk a little bit about how you can monitor the progress of your site and how you can check how you rank. Does anyone know where they rank? Is anyone ranking number one for, for sort of, or, or tracking their, their search rankings? Yeah, a couple of people, good. I think it's important, and I think one of the, the sort of um, comments that I quite often get, and I, I do a bit of um, sort of training small businesses or sort of basic uh, training on this stuff, and, you know, but, you know, my company, Acme Moving, ranks number one when you type in Acme Moving. That would, should be a given. Like, your brand term, you should be ranking number one. What you probably want to rank for are things like, you know, Melbourne removalists or removalists, Melbourne, that sort of thing. So why should you care? Um, so I think the main thing is you should care because if you've got a good product or a service or you've created good content or you've got a good cause, um, you want people to be able to find what you've created. And creating it isn't enough, you know, build, build it and they will come, kind of, but not necessarily. Um, Really, what you want to do is try and make your stuff being found on the first page. I mean, this is a pretty respectable result as it is. Um, and I know that Anthony, uh, when I actually do a search for what Anthony isn't ranking for when it comes to WordPress manuals, I actually had to search a couple of times. But usually people would say that's a reasonable result. Uh, what we're talking about is results that end up going, you know, four, five, six, maybe not even in the first hundred results. And it's, it's common. There's a lot of good quality uh, stuff out there. That, that doesn't rank. So this is why it's important. You want more visitors, customers, and they're not exactly the same thing. And you also want a greater opportunity to actually make sales or conversions. So you want people signing up to what you've got, your mailing list or um, you know, a lead 
uh, for your client. This is sort of the, what you want. This is what it equals. Um, and it's not all about getting visitors. You can rank high in the search engines and still lose your customers. So that's a sort of step beyond the scope of what we're talking about today, which is how to actually convert those, you, those visitors and get them into customers. That's a whole other process. But if you're sort of following this stuff, it's um, put you in the right direction. So getting found. So just um, you know, being online does not guarantee being found. That's um, absolutely true. And especially if you're talking about a very competitive industry, um, you'll notice that a lot of the results are dominant. And you can usually tell if there's um, advertising. If a lot of advertisers, chances are there's, uh, you've got a lot of competition and you'll have to do a lot of work. Um, and it's also worth saying that you know, the, the email that $100 and we'll get you to number one and you know, or use this tool and you'll be guaranteed results. Um, good SEO or good online marketing takes a lot of work. It's hard work. Um, do you guys agree? It's hard work. Um, so if, if, you, if you want to, you know, even if you've got a really great product or your client has a really great product, it's, um, there's a lot involved and it's ongoing. So, you know, you, you know, we at the SEO Meetup get people saying, oh, my SEO company is charging, you know, $500 a month or $1,500 a month for my, my business. But the thing is, they might have to do work on that site every day. The, the grey area is where you've got good and bad, as with any industry. But uh, generally speaking, if you're in a competitive industry, it's going to take a lot of work. Um, and, and usually also offset by paid advertising and, and that sort of, again, beyond the scope of this talk. So two of the words that you might hear, uh, oh, your on-site is bad or you've got crappy, you know, off-site. So these are two terms that you'll hear quite a lot. And it's pretty simple when you think about it. Um, on-site is what you've got control over on your own site. Okay, so things like your content, your titles, your headings, and these sorts of things do have a... Uh, they are relevant to how Google uh, ranks your site. So things like, um, you know, using keywords in your headings and in your URLs, these are sorts of things that are important. Now, I always say try and do it tastefully. You don't want to be obnoxious about it. And some people get carried away and they have these menu, menus that have three or four keywords in them for a menu. And it's like, this is a... It's fine to have, you know, about, or it's fine to have this. You don't have to have about you know, Acme removalist in Melbourne. So the, usually, um, you know, making sure that you've got a good solid keyword strategy, which we get to uh, f touch on a few times throughout the talk, is important. Um, you've probably heard of meta descriptions. Um, also images. This, you know, usually we talk about making sure that we're using keywords, but also the quality of what you're delivering. And I know that the, um, the guys will start uh, talking a little bit about uh, you know, professional uh, content writers or photographers. This, this sort of, these are sorts of things that you really have to start thinking about if you, if you really want to compete. Because it's more likely people will share your stuff, it's more likely people will reference or link to your, your content. Um, so keywords and content strategy. So uh, our last talk at the SEO Meetup was about um, content strategy and it's very important. Uh, is anyone working on, uh, you know, involved in, in content creation? sort of aggressively and, yep. So it's, it's pretty important. If you're gonna, you know, if you can't do it yourself, uh, it's well worth somebody paying somebody to come along and help you with your content. Um, and it's really, a lot of the time, it is the difference between getting found or not. Uh, Canonicalisation, so this is stuff that makes sure if people are using your, your um, content outside your site, that Google knows that you're the original source um, and also helps make sure that Google only sees one piece of content uh, for a particular... With WordPress, there's a few different ways to get to content, and that's uh, when we talk for, about plugins, we address how to fix that. And that leads on to robots.txt, and also just overall configuration of your site. And Michael uh, will jump into a, a, some pretty um, sort of technical discussion on that. So off-site. Uh, after you've got your on-site stuff done, uh, definitely... How do you get links? And, you know, it's a common question that you hear. How do I get links? I know that, you know, my SEO person told me links is what it's all about. How do I get them? The, the, you get them if you've got good quality stuff. If you're doing good work, you'll get links. Um, and, you know, people talk about, you know, links being the holy grail. They are very important. And they're played down by a few professionals, but they are still um, a very important factor. And I think one of the reasons is because not only is it something that Google can calculate, 
as an endorsement if people, a lot of people are linking to you. Um, but also, it's a, good, it's a good sign that you've got uh, good work. So, bad links can hurt your site, and I just sort of threw that one in there only because there's, you know, uh, bad SEO can actually harm your site. So when Google updates its algorithms, sometimes they look at things that have been a bit sketchy or they've looked at ways people can game the system and they'll actually devalue those sites or they won't add any extra weight to those sites. So what would have worked before might not work today or definitely doesn't work today. To some degree. To some degree. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. So we, we play around with this stuff and sort of test the, um, you know, stretch the, the boundaries and all that kind of stuff just to see what works. And it's definitely not foolproof, um, but it's not something that we would recommend, uh, you know, going out and buying links or trying anything that perhaps is a bit sketchy. Uh, so social media, Web 2.0 properties. So that is, you know, things like your bookmarking, social bookmarking, social news. These are things that, if used correctly, are really good ways. And really, it's not just about using the platform to get links. It's about establishing yourself uh, as an authority and getting yourself known. Examples of good links would be some news sites, natural looking links, anything that's natural. And if you can do work that attracts natural links, that's really, I'd say, that's sort of the holy grail. So I, my kind of um, mantra is that, you know, awesome marketing will trump, you know, any marketing budget. You know, if you've got money to throw at something, that's important. But if you've got a really unique idea, uh, you know, that can sort of go well and truly beyond what, um, you know, a traditional marketing budget can allow for. Spammy stuff. So when you talk about bad links, we're talking about um, unnatural, uh, spammy-looking links. Search engines are pretty good at detecting this stuff. And, and there's an example. You know, blog comments um, on sites that, that have no relevancy to the industry. And we can show. Michael will show some tools about how to uh, detect that. So how can you get links? Create high-quality and unique content. Uh, and again, blogs, social media, video, ebooks, newsletters, the list goes on and on. The buzzword is inbound marketing. I mean, it's, it is a word, but it is also overused. Um, and then people talk about link earning. In the SEO industry, I suppose you hear link building used a lot. But really, if you create good content, um, people will share your, your content, they'll link to you, they'll reference you, which is what you're after. But think creatively. Um, you know, what are people searching for in your industry? You know, you don't have to create an infographic about Acme removalists. You could create an infographic about how to do, how to move on the cheap. So that's sort of something that, you know, think outside the square a little bit. So keyword research is, is critical. And if you haven't done this already with your site and you want to see some improvement, it's definitely an area to focus on. Um, we cover a whole bunch of tools. There are, you know, hundreds of tools when it comes to keyword research. Um, but really, you start off by what do you want to be found for? So that's like taking a step back and say, right, I don't want to be found for Acme movers. I want to be found for removalists Melbourne. And you might find when you actually start doing the research that that's ultra competitive. So you want to do a bit of competitor analysis and see, have you got strong competitors? You might not be able to go head to head, but you might be able to pick up things that they don't rank um, as highly on. So you really want to know what your audience is, what they're searching for. And also, um, ideally, pick up the low-hanging fruit. The low-hanging fruit is the stuff that doesn't have um, as low competition, but a high search volume. And we'll cover the tools that you can use to find out how many times people search for a particular term. It's, it's hit and miss. Average, generally, it's pretty good, but Google gives you a tool. You can put in, you know, removal of Melbourne, and it will tell you all the search terms that are related to those terms as well, along with the search volume and the uh, competition. So Google helps us with this. Um, you know, using your keywords in your uh, copy, in your you know, blog posts or you know, your pages, um, it's, it's always a fine balance. I mean, I've published a lot of stuff that has you know, the examples of the bad just to see if it works. And generally speaking, if you've got a, an audience, getting something that they want to click on, something that's enticing for them to click on is good. But if you're talking about optimising for search engines, trying to use the keywords tastefully you know, naturally in your headings and titles is important. So I've got some examples there. You know, getting your books in order doesn't really, you know, search engines really can't get a lot from that. Bookkeeping tips does. So there's lots of tools and methods um, to look for keywords with high traffic, low competition, words that you can make great titles out of. So something that you can find that, well, okay, so I find that, you know, removalists, that's fine, but moving, moving house, these tend to be words that people search for a lot. 
You could do a lot with those sorts of keywords um, and make great content with it. And there's a link uh, to worth checking out as well, which um, <coughs> uses a whole bunch of different sources to give you some suggestions. So that's sort of the, you know, the, the main uh, sort of one-stop shop. It's Google. It used to be called AdWords Keyword Tool. Now it's called Keyword Planner. Um, you sign in. Uh, you can spend a lot of time in this, and it's one thing that uh, even sort of beginner level stuff I would recommend uh, going to and having a look. They've changed it quite a lot, and you know, I can see some, you know. It's all exact match now, which is not useful at all. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, the thing with uh, Google is always changing, so you know, there are other keyword tools, but I think using a combination of, of what you think people are searching for and trying to get the best data that you can to make informed decisions of what, what that's about. So to recap, um, SEO basics, why it's important. It's important if you want your stuff to be found. You know, creating the content alone isn't enough. There are, you know, in the last 12 months, there's been more, you know, content created than since dawn of time. So we're creating, the world's creating content at this, you know, enormous rate. So getting your stuff found is becoming harder. So you have to think, you know, a bit um, strategically about it. Um, areas to focus on. Uh, on-site and off-site SEO, really we're talking about making sure that your site's structured correctly and making sure that you've got stuff that people want to link to. And there's some plugins and some tools that we'll show you how to actually maximise that and also the importance of keyword research. But we love Bing. Bing's pretty cool. <laughs> okay. So I'll introduce uh, Peter now. He'll be talking about WordPress uh, and WordPress capabilities and plugins. So make him welcome. Thank you. Hello, uh, my name's Peter Mead. I, um, I started using WordPress in about 2004. Uh, when it first came out, it was a really cool blogging engine. That's what it was pretty much known for. Uh, <clears throat> started doing SEO in about 2005 and um, had a few successes back then, but um, Pretty much the last couple of years, decided to really focus my business, narrow, narrow it down to WordPress and SEO solely. So that's what I do now is WordPress SEO consulting, and been able to get some pretty good results for small to medium enterprise businesses. Maybe turning over thirty to fifty thousand dollars worth of sales online per month, that sort of thing. So that's the angle that I come from is just the really the experience that I've got. I think that. SEO to me is more of a craft. I think that there's a fair bit of science involved and technology, but uh, it's a very fluid thing and you sometimes need to change your strategies depending on what is actually happening, especially with Google. Uh, you know, we've got to play second fiddle to Google all the time. So uh, SEO and WordPress is a match made in heaven. It, um, not much else I can say, but it really is. I mean, going back uh, years ago, we had to get into the HTML files and edit the title tags and edit the uh, description tags. Now we can go in through a nice, pretty um, user interface and do all that sort of stuff. I've got just some things that um, help me to focus on the bigger picture of what we're trying to keep in mind while we're doing SEO. Um, so that uh, we don't get distracted and get caught up in the tasks too much. So I've just got a few acronyms. So I've said, for quality, I like to think of PLAF. Or, uh, so what it really means is people link to articles or great quality content, their articles, um, which then, um, so if it's really good quality articles, they'll create links to it. And Google loves that sort of stuff and starts ranking your site. So that's pretty, pretty simple. That's really all. That's really the whole sort of um, process of SEO from a really high level. And then some other factors to keep in mind would be the speed of your site. Um, S, um, WordPress can so the, to, to the acronym okay. there is SAT. So speed, articles, and time on site. But the point there is that uh, if you've got a stack of plugins running on your site and it's slowing your site down, it's just common sense. You, you go to someone's site that's running slow, you're going to just probably go to someone else's site instead. 
So you could have plugins that are dragging it down, or you could have um, maybe you're paying for cheap hosting and it's um, you know it's not running that fast. And you could maybe fork out instead of you know five dollars a month, you might fork out thirty dollars a month, and actually it'll make a big difference. Um, Google wants Google wants people to go to their search engine, and the results that it shows people, it wants them to be happy. They're a company. So, uh, same thing if you've got great quality content on your site, people are going to stay on your site and read what you've written or watch the videos you've made. If you're not a, um, if you're not a good author, get, pay someone who's a good author. It makes a big difference. Uh, there's, there's all kinds of algorithms that Google's spent a lot of money on developing to test to see the quality of those articles. Uh, so, that of course adds up to people spending more time on your site. And the more time on your site, the lower the bounce rate. So I think those three things really work together to, um, to, to sort of form the main principles to keep in mind. Um, so of course, WordPress helps us to, uh, to achieve this without sort of too much effort having to dive into code and that sort of thing. So what, how, uh, how good is WordPress out of the box? SEO. So um, probably the it's been it's been built um, by the community or you know directed the the design of it has been uh, guided by the community. It's well supported. All this sort of stuff has been built into it or built in with mind. So um, it's it's a uh, it's easy to use. It doesn't we don't have to get bogged down in technical details. Um, it allows us to Concentrate on titles, headings, content, all the things that make a big difference. And uh, it's a professional publishing platform. So yeah, um, one, one of the things that I think is a real bonus, uh, which I don't know if the other CMS, you know, Joomla, and I'm not sure they do this that well, but permalinks make a real big difference. So, um, so the permalink structure, change that, go into your settings and change it so that it reads human readable and um, so that when you when you choose your keyword strategy um, you can have your titles matching your content matching with your keywords the keywords appear in the actual URL in the in the bar uh, the address bar and it just all adds up Google goes yep all the factors are there and starts ranking so uh, it, it indexes really fast um, I don't know, I've had experiences where I've built a WordPress site, put it online, and within a couple of hours, Google's already indexed it. Um, so I've, you've had to have make sure all your keywords, everything are all sorted out, the content's ready, everything, before Google indexes it. Otherwise, then you've got to go and try and get it re-indexed. It'll happen, but um, not for maybe a couple of weeks, or depending what it... Uh, but anyway, so the other, other thing, is anyone had the experience of um, this? This little gem inside of WordPress, the search engine visibility. So, obviously, if that's ticked, Google's not going to, you know, it's not going to go and crawl your site. It won't index your site, and it's a pretty low chance you'll be found. Um, sometimes, if you set up your WordPress site and you do the one-click install, you know the. Um, through, through your uh, web hosting cPanel, you can do the one, the very fast install. Sometimes they give you the option there of saying, you know, um, to turn that on, and you might forget, and later on, we've had people ask me and say, I can't find, no one can find my site, Google can't find my site, and uh, we'll dig around and find out that that is, is ticked. So, um, that's a one to watch out for. Peter, there's also an instance when uh, someone's developing a website and they'll use the robots.txt file and actually disall uh, disallow, I guess, the search engine from indexing the site. Mm -hmm. And I've seen plenty of times where large companies have launched brand new websites and have actually blocked all search engines. Mm -hmm. And it's been a few weeks until, say, we've picked up on it or really pitching for the business and we happen to find it after the fact. So there's that there, but also, yeah, they can do it manually. Mm -hmm. um, so that's um, what Michael was saying about the robots text file. And this, this sort of does a pseudo, it does a similar thing where it kind of generates 
a pseudo robots text file and does it that. It does on a page-by-page -page basis. Mm. Uh, so, so the other thing is, is uh, WordPress with you, obviously people know they've already experienced plugins. They've got plugins. You've all got plugins on your site, and it's probably fair to say that it's really one of the most powerful things about WordPress is that we can just go along and find a, someone who's written a plugin that does a whole chunk of functionality we want it to do and just plug it in. So um, the, the handy thing for SEO, for WordPress, is that there are people who've made these plugins specifically for doing SEO. And uh, the recommended plugins, so the first, the first and biggest and best that I like recommending when it comes to SEO for WordPress is the one that Yoast has made, and um, look, it's uh, there are other plugins, and we'll go through those. But this one um, is really user friendly, and uh, it just allows you to get into the process of doing your own SEO if that's what you're interested in doing. Um, with that sort of getting too bogged down in a lot of the detail, so. Uh, this guy, Zeust, I'm not sure how you, <laughs> I'm not sure how you, uh, I think it's Zeust, but he's, he's a, um, he's a pro, he's on, he's, um, an SEO guy, and he's developed this plugin, and, um, so, yeah, he's got, he's developed it with a lot of the SEO functionality in mind, uh, it's very easy to use, so some of the features here, which we've got, we've taken this from the, um, from this, the plugin site. And uh, so just saying, with one plugin, you can do everything you want for SEO on the site, for on-site SEO, that is. So as Chris already mentioned, the on-site stuff is everything you can do on your own site. And um, so, yeah, there's making some claims there. The most complete SEO plugin, yeah, that's, uh, I'd probably agree with that. Others might not. Um, so this is a good one, the content analysis functionality, which um, which I'll get into in a minute, but um, it automatically goes through and it analyzes the content on your blog post uh, before you publish it. So who, who here is using Yoast on their site already? Yeah, that's, that's pretty good. So how are you finding it? Is it working? Awesome. Get, getting some results? So, of course, yeah, so it can help you guide you through the stuff, but you still need to have the. Yeah. So and that's where you, your um, keyword research and that sort of thing would come in, and yeah. And by the way, I saw in the financial review a few months, quite a few months ago, they reviewed it in their tech section. Yep. Peter Moran, I think it was, who's in a door frame, and they said how raved about how good it was. Yep. That's a, yeah, that's a good um, endorsement, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so, um, so there's some other things it can do. Um, it does a lot, like it can automatically generate the XML sitemaps. Um, so XML sitemaps, so we want, we want Google to consume these sitemaps. Um, it's just more things we can tell Google about your site to make sure that it gets found. Um, and of course it's got the many more things that you wouldn't even know about, but um, so just a, just a bit of a uh, practical features here that I like. So you can set up templates for your titles and your meta descriptions, so that um, if you by default it will it will um, uh, it will take care of your meta descriptions and titles for you based on some variables that you set. So you don't have to actively go. I mean, I don't know if you've got hundreds and hundreds of um, blog posts, then it might take a lot of work to go in individually and change every single one of those um, titles yourself. So you can use some rules and do it automatically. Um, so the, the SEO meta box to optimise your post title and meta description and the snippet preview shows you what it's going to look like. So I think if anyone's, if you're using Yoast, do this stuff and um, this here, 
I don't know, just have a think about it. If you were looking at this in Google, would you click on that? That's the kind of, that's really what it, um, it's all about. The, at the end of the day, it's people clicking on the links in Google that go to your site. So if you look at that and you're doing this, you think, yeah, it's all right, step-by-step -step guide, yeah. Um, but if it's something like, um, <laughs> I don't know, go bananas over marketing, I don't know, it would, you might not click on that as much. Uh, so do, do these, go through all this stuff, step by step, and then maybe go to each one of these tabs before you publish the content. So once you publish the content, it's really up to Google when it comes along and indexes that page. So if you get all these things, um, all your ducks in a row, go through these, so make sure it looks good, it's going to look good in the, on Google. You've got your different thing, you've got your focus keyword here, you've done your keyword research, uh, you've, you've got your, um, your headings, your page style, make sure the keyword's appearing in the content, um, all the things. So the SEO title, what's it going to look like in Google? And then a meta description, which is, which is pretty important. Google places a lot of focus on that as well. Get all that ready, get all that right. Go through the, then go through the next bit, which is your traffic lights. You don't have to get it, you don't have to get them all green, but you're at least if you haven't got them green, you've got a good reason why not. Um, but this just helps to guide you through all the things that it's just maybe too many things for people to remember otherwise. Um, so this this one here, um, who uses the flesh reading ease score to check their content before they publish it? That's a really um, it's a big deal. So uh, this one here is saying at uh, 43.7, that could probably be improved a bit. You want to get it up to around 60 or 70 percent. It just means that the grammar reads well, the sentences aren't too long, you're not just um, mumbling or trying to fill in text on your content. Uh, it, sorry, but it yeah. depends on your audience too. So if you're writing yeah. a technical blog post, it's obviously going to be hard to read. It's not going to be Absolutely. So it's not always... Yeah, you can't, none of this is hard and fast, and you can't always um, get a high score with the flesh reading score. But, um, see so this one, I guess you could put an image on this post, and maybe put some relevant, you could use your keyword on the, um, uh, on the alt tag, tastefully, and yeah, so that could improve the ranking a bit. So there's a fair bit here to go through, and it really guides you through. Um, interesting one here is this second last, which I think maybe people don't, just general SEO, saying you've never used this keyword before, very good. So that's an important one to remember because uh, we really want to have one focus keyword per page so we don't end up competing with ourselves on our own site for keywords. So, um, yeah. Um, anyway, that's uh, so we want to the advanced tab. Look, I don't know, we probably you don't have to go in here that often, but sometimes it's you want to go and do a 301 redirect, or uh, maybe you don't want a page, you want to block it in the robots file, you don't want a search engine to find this page. So, all handy tools. Um, so, on the list of posts, look down the, down the list here and this is really handy. This, this will help you if you've got somewhere you've got a file or an Excel spreadsheet with your keyword strategy in it. You can match that up and go, well, how am I travelling with my keyword strategy compared to how's it looking on site? I've got my on site and SEO sorted out. So, of course, um, sometimes, uh, I don't know, it might be the red one doesn't always, you've got to still have your common sense and you, your content needs to be. Think of who your audience is. A red doesn't always mean red, but that's just up to you to have a think about as well. So that was that's Yoast, um, which is I just recommend that if you're especially if you're a beginner, just start using it. And uh, but yes, it is free. Um, that there is a um, premium version coming out very soon. Uh, do you know much of the, the details of these? It's got some more advanced uh, features. So, the different types of um, optimization. But generally, the, the core core SEO features are you know, pretty good. Mm. Is what, what you need. Yeah. 
So of course this does this is all on site SEO. There's no we haven't talked about link building or anything. So that's a whole other story. But there are other plugins for WordPress which can help you with your SEO efforts. Um, another big one which a lot of people probably have heard of is the all-in-one SEO pack. Any who's using that one here? Yeah. So that used to be, I discovered that one a fair while ago before I knew about the Yoast one, and it was the, the big one that everyone used, but I think um, if you, it's kind of pretty easy to change over if you want to, but there's nothing wrong with this, it's a very good plugin, and uh, in actual fact it's probably got more, more of a general, generalised following than the other one, but um, it does all the same kind of things. Uh, so broken link checker, so it's important to make sure we don't have broken links on our site. If you go to someone's, if you go find, do a search, you get found on Google, and then you go to their site and it doesn't go anywhere or it's a broken link, 404 error, that's, you're not going to be very happy, you won't go back again. Uh, Google will start ranking you down a bit, and, um, or others will come up above you, that's probably the right terminology. Uh, so... Um, Google XML sitemaps, so it's pretty important to have a sitemap and to submit it to Google Webmaster Tools. And Yoast allows you to do that, but if you don't want to use Yoast, you can use this plugin to do it. It's got a lot of features. And um, sitemaps for images. So if, you're, if you've got a photography website or if you're doing a lot of images, it's definitely worth um, installing this one, having a sitemap and then submitting that as well. So what can happen is if we've got a lot of plugins on our site, we can get a lot of guff, a lot of rubbish starts appearing in the... So if you just right click and go view source on your page and you can just start seeing a whole bunch of rubbish coming in there, maybe JavaScript, CSS code, things like that. This will help clean that up. And. Uh, so this one's, this one's good is for your social sharing. So sometimes when you do, you, um, you might have a page on your site and you want to go share that link onto Facebook, you know, maybe using Hootsuite or something and the images don't show up properly or the description doesn't come through. So this helps to put all those things in place so when your, your uh, content's shared on social sites that it comes up properly. Uh, minute follow, so this will help your site run quicker. And... Uh, just shrink your JavaScript and shrink your CSS. And um, so we all know that if your site runs quicker, more people want to go on it, they want to stay on there, and Google will start ranking it higher. And uh, yeah, so some, I'll just go on to these themes uh, here because a lot of themes you've probably all noticed, or who, who uses a theme that's already got SEO built into the theme? Yeah, so. That's a pretty popular thing, and a lot of these, these uh, frameworks and themes, and you can go onto um, Theme Forest and you can get themes that are labelled as SEO themes. Um, you can use those if you want, there's nothing wrong with that, just, just um, maybe do a bit of research on how good they really are. They may not work as well as you think, but this sort of stuff is fine and, and I think it works for people. Interesting to note that Woo themes, don't have it, they used to have it built in, SEO, but they've decided to recommend Yoast instead. So, so just a recap. So, um, yeah, so uh, WordPress and SEO, if you, if you, um, you want to try and do it yourself or, or even do it for small to medium businesses, or even large, large businesses use it too, it's, um, it does go well together, it's a real good mix. And um, out of the box, it'll, it'll um, just make your efforts a lot easier. And uh, so, yeah, have a think about the plugins you're using. Don't use too many, and maybe even if you're, if you're getting some plugins that are overlapping, maybe think not to install too many. Um, it could affect, you could adversely affect the. <coughs> Meta, I don't know, you might end up with duplicate meta descriptions or something like that. So, um, but yeah, so uh, themes and frameworks, yeah, so we can, we can use the built-in SEO stuff there or you, you can even um, dive in and start 
don't use any plugins, just do all your own SEO on WordPress yourself. Uh, but that's another whole, that's another whole adventure. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so I've probably all felt a bit like this sometimes. <laughs> anyway, that's my section done. I hope you found that interesting. And uh, any questions, we're going to have a big talk about questions at the end. So, um, yeah, hopefully that's helped put it in perspective, WordPress and SEO. So, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. I'll introduce you to Michael. Cheers, thank you. Um, where am I? I got out of my intro slide here, but I've been doing SEO for 12 years now. Started back in the days where pretty much the common day was to cloak the content, show users one thing, so search engines is another. So it's definitely moved forward from there. But I work both agency side, client side, for, yeah, over the last 12 years. Started getting into WordPress when it was kind of pushed in front of me, working for an agency at the same time. I started creating, say, affiliate websites and just uh, other blogs and whatnot. So I pretty much self-taught everything that I've done. Again, um, I find WordPress to do professionally everything I needed to from an SEO point of view, from, I guess, title tags, canonical tags, to all the page speed stuff. I mean, it's perfect for what I needed to do from an SEO point of view. So hopefully, um, I don't bore anyone because it is quite techy, this section. It refers to tools and whatnot. So I'll see how it goes. Um, H1s and H2s, I mean, there's a lot of guidelines out there. I recommend SEO Moz. They do have, um, I guess, the guidelines of, ha say, how long a title tag should be, how many H1s on a page and all that. So there's a lot of guides out there around specifics. But in this instance, I know um, specifically H1 search engines or best practice says you should only have one on a page. Generally, with a lot of WordPress themes itself, you'll find that homepage sliders might have multiple H1 tags or they put, assign that tag to maybe keywords which aren't actually relevant to the page content. Uh, granted, a lot of inner pages are normally fine, but we do go into a couple of other tools in a few slides time that can kind of diagnose or show what those actually are on a page. But again, they're normally hidden with the HTML code, and they normally use formatting and other things. And then logos. Is yeah, logos, logos is which is normally the best practice, but... Yeah. So if yeah. you need, need to make something bigger, use CSS and uh, not... So, some people think the easy way is just to use a H1 to make something big, but um, can... Yeah, it's not, not considered best practice. Okay, so going back to what I've been saying before where um, developers can some, uh, sometimes accidentally to unblock a website. Um, if you go to your website and type in robots.txt, you can normally view what it has in it. It's just a generic text file which kind of gives directions to search engines um, of how they should treat your website or just give them instructions of what they should do once they actually get there. So I think I actually just said that part. You can edit the robots.txt file manually or within a plugin or sometimes some SEO plugins can configure it for you. Um, yeah, can control it, each page is desired. I do talk about a little techie thing there, which is probably a limitation of WordPress. Um, but normally, it's just to give instructions to search engines what they should index and what they shouldn't index. Is, is that one from the cPanel? Um, normally, if you go to the FTP server, you can normally access it through there. It's normally sitting in the oh, root directory of your site. The yeah, you can edit it through there for your file manager. Um, in addition to that there, it might be worth copying that down. I recommend everyone put that inside their um, robots.txt file. Uh, what can actually happen is Google can actually index your search function on your website and if someone exploits that, they could probably create a million duplicate pages of your website with no content on them. So by implementing that little line of code there, you can pretty much tell search engines to not uh, crawl your search files. And I know um, at their CEO, I think it was SMX Sydney a couple of years ago, that was brought up and someone did it as a prank to someone else and just decided to index a million rubbish pages on their website. Yep. And, and I think the thing is, especially if you're in a very competitive um, industry, in this, this particular uh, presentation with somebody that works with uh, uh, online gambling in, in the UK, so um, there's a lot of really sketchy stuff that, that um, you know, the competitors are doing. So that's why this is um, you know, a bit of a safeguard against somebody doing something malicious to, to your site. Um. Yeah. Okay, so excluding content, I know from, I guess from an SEO point of view, normally when you do install WordPress, granted it is a blog platform, you normally end up with, um, I guess, category pages, tag archives, author pages, um, and I think there's also, I think I said four of them. Uh, normally don't, these don't have any SEO value, they're normally just <coughs> copies of every other piece of content on your website. I mean, they're good for UX, but normally they're not really good for SEO just because they're not actually unique in any way. Um, and a lot of the time you can't, um, out of the box anyway, give it unique title tags and whatnot. So really those pages don't really have any SEO value. 
Uh, most SEO plugins, granted I'm one who uses uh, all-in-one SEO, you can um, prove out nice, pretty uh, control panel. You can exclude search engines from crawling those particular pages of your site just for a click of a button. Uh, Canonicalisation, uh, as Chris was saying earlier on, um, normally if your website may use parameters or if you do um, advertising elsewhere, they might actually link to you parameters. If you don't have canonical, uh, canonical tag installed, um, you can end up with duplicates of your content um, on, um, in Google itself, which can, I guess, dilute, um, I guess, link authority. If someone's linked to you with a parameter, that link really won't be worth too much because it's linking to a duplicate page. So uh, by enabling that there, you can pretty much consolidate a lot of duplicate content, make your website stronger, and a lot of that there actually is pretty much default in most SEO plugins these days. It's pretty much on by default. So if you still want those plugins, it always takes care of those issues. Okay, so this is a nice big slab of text. Um, so this really... Oh, we missed a couple, okay. Excellent sign up. So I think um, Peter was touching on it earlier on. Again, there's plugins that specifically do this for you and in an automated uh, fashion as well. But normally an XML sitemap is just a, say, an XML file or a text file containing all the URLs of your website. And when a search engine comes to your website, they normally look for this file. And if you've uploaded any new content recently, it will consult this. And it just means that it's more, uh, Google's more efficient in crawling your website. You can find new content a lot quicker. Um, and also, you can tell it normally how often the content changes, the priority level, and also the last modified date. So this results in um, Google crawling your website or other search engines uh, crawling your website more efficiently. So a big slab of text. Um, so I think it was Pete or even Chris was talking about earlier on uh, regarding uh, page speed optimization. Normally trying to make sure your website um, loads as quickly as possible. This is probably something you can look at later on. You don't really need to understand that piece of code, but these are pretty much some copy and paste solutions that you can um, copy into your HT access file. Again, it's another file which sits in your redirect of your, of your site, which normally no one sees. But by enabling these things here, you can um, normally the big one here is normally enabling compression, which is like zipping a file. It pretty much means that your website's a lot smaller in terms of its HTML code. Also, caching is another one. That just means that when you go from page to page, a user or even search engines don't need to reload the same file over and over again. So it just results in your website loading a lot quicker, especially going from more pages. And there's a few other things there as well. A lot of these issues do get brought up within um, a couple more slides when you talk about the individual tools to diagnose page speed issues. Uh, but I know from previous experience, a lot of these work straight out of a box. Depending on who your web host is, sometimes they uh, enable uh, like uh, sorry, gzip or deflate by default. I'll, I'm gonna say the bad ones normally don't. So if you paste that code in or if some of those things don't work, it might be time to find a new web host. I know with Venture IP who I use, they're quite cheap, but they have pretty much everything I need to do SEO. Uh, now tools, again, we cover different aspects, be it on site, link building, whatnot. So, and there's actually so many out there there's probably too many to list, but these are a few that I use. Uh, Screaming Frog, uh, what you normally is just put in a, a website URL there, and it actually then crawls your, uh, your website as Google normally would, and then shows you all the different parameters on your website. So these couple of tabs here actually show you if you normally got any broken links or look for different res uh, response codes. So additional to uh, the automated plugin of broken links, this could actually do it as well. Um, then there's a few here which actually went export. Again, this is all exported with Excel, so you can manipulate the data any way you want. Uh, but you can export all the total tags of your website, description tags. Um, also, if you happen to use a keyword tag, it does do that. But then you can diagnose issues around the H1 tags. So like, is there multiple H1 tags? You can see as well through that there, are they assigned to the correct fields? Uh, then through here as well, there's normally directives and custom, which you can normally then use to diagnose a canonical tag issues. So are they installed? Are they being implemented correctly? So normally if you just run across your site, go for each one here, you can manipulate them as well. Uh, granted, I can't do it on this screen. But if you actually go to say page tiles, you can, it actually has a field around character limits. So you can sort by characters and that will tell you if it's too long, if it, um, title tag's too long, too short. If you sort by the field of what actually is, you can see if they're duplicated. So you can definitely um, yeah, use this tool here, export to Excel and manipulate the data how you want and diagnose a whole heap of issues. And it is free. There is, a, I guess, a paid version, but if you're running it under, say, 500 URLs, it's fine. And now Scrapebox. It um, has been viewed as a, um, say, black hat tool in the past because it's normally used to um, spam blogs, especially WordPress, but you can actually use it for a legitimate purpose. Um, don't think it's really there. 
But what you can actually do is say um, scrape or copy um, Google search results. So if you put a query in, you can actually then uh, get all the URLs associated with that query. So it's good for, say, competitor analysis. Um, also, keyword research, you can actually scrape uh, Google's uh, border suggestions. So if you type in remove lists, then you can actually copy all the different variations that come under it as well. So the order suggestions. Uh, you can check um, as well, normally if link, uh, uh, links are pointing to your website, if you actually put in a whole list of uh, URLs um, and then put in your website, it'll actually then uh, tell you what bank of text is, where on your website uh, and it links to. I mean, I commonly use that these days for diagnosing some issues around duplicate content because you can actually see all the URLs that Google's indexed on your website. And no, there's actually half a page down here. I also use it for link removal. So I test if um, links are still live um, from what, I guess, SEO Moz or other tools have actually told so me. Michael, why would you want to remove links? I can't explain. Uh, that's a whole nother um, yeah, can of worms. Why would you want to remove links? Um, Google's uh, releasing, I guess, a lot of algorithm updates. As of recently on the weekend, they up, uh, updated with the uh, Penguin 2.0 algorithm update. And earlier on, what Chris was talking about, uh, say, low-quality links, Google's punishing websites that um, utilise low-quality links to kind of artificially inflate their online authority. So I guess to combat maybe uh, what we've done in the past from SEOs, we're now actually seeking to remove um, some of the bad stuff we've done in the past. And if you have got, say, a manual penalty from Google, you can get re that revoked if you've showed, um, I guess, evidence that you've actually gone out and tried removing um, these toxic links in the past. But that's a whole sort of another yeah, presentation in itself. Uh, Open Site Explorer. So this here is mostly focused on uh, all the links pointing to your website. Uh, there is a free version, there's a paid version, but the free one does give you a lot of uh, information. This is from moz.com. But normally all you do is put in your website URL or I guess a competitor if you want to do some competitor analysis. And once it does load up, um, it shows all the links um, that point to your website that they happen to, found, uh, happen to find. And then you can uh, manipulate the data in any way you want. You can look at what the most used anchor text is. You can see, I guess, what domains they come from. And then also, SEO Moz itself has its own sort of uh, metric system to show you what links are the most authoritative, which ones are low quality. And you can just manipulate the data any way you want um, to give an overview of um, how your website or your link profile actually looks. And again, this probably comes into some link removal presentation. Yep. Um, Majestic SEO does do very similar things. Probably gives you a lot more data than what SEO Moz actually happens to do. Um, and also has some nice pretty graphs as well, so you can do some competitor analysis on the same, um, same page, shows you some like the link velocity as well to show how the number of links has grown over time. Um, so I know Majestic SEO does, uh, it is a free tool, it is a pay tool, but if you actually use it on your own website, you can actually extract all the information um, yeah, that it actually has. It's only when you want to start doing competitive analysis is when it becomes limited in terms of a free version. Um, page speed, so now going back to a couple of slides time where I had the HD access code. Um, there's multiple versions of this. There's, say, the online version there. There's also a Chrome plugin and a uh, Firefox plugin. Personally, I like the Firefox plugin. Uh, but what you do is you just put in a URL and then it will actually then, I don't think I have a screenshot of it, uh, then be it in your browser or on this website, it will actually give you a whole list of recommendations of what you can do to, um, I guess, quicken um, the load times of your page itself. And I mean, Chris did a presentation on this, um, actually it was only it was last week or the month before? before. Month before. Um, but PageSpeed, not only good for SEO, can improve, I guess, your website conversion rate, reduces bounce rate and whatnot, um, and also can reduce, say, your, um, your overhead speed if you're paying for bandwidth, you can reduce that significantly by implementing um, those particular things. Um, good thing as well, granted, I think about two years ago, this was kind of unheard of from an SEO point of view, and be it that I've used it, um, the descriptions or the explanations it gives about each are really thorough. Uh, when it shows there, you click on it, it normally will tell you how to implement the solution or you just can Google the solution, but it's quite easy to pick up and um, yeah, work with. Granted, it never existed until yeah, only about a year or two ago. Um, so why slow is Yahoo's version of uh, the similar plugin. It does pretty much everything that um, the page speed does, granted I don't like it as much, but it does have some pretty graphs. So normally I use both in conjunction of each other. I normally take screenshots with Yahoo because that's nice pretty um, pie graphs of how big your website is in terms of its different assets. So how large is your JavaScript, how large, large are your images, your HTML code, <coughs> whatnot. But I found my one a lot more comprehensive. And again, this can either be, um, say, I think server side, or I guess it's a, um, an extension that you can install as well. Uh, SEO X-Ray, it's a tool by, uh, sorry, another extension by, uh, oops, I've got the wrong there. Um, SEO Book, 
Uh, I personally don't use this too much, but what I can actually do is when you go to a web page, you normally just click it and it'll actually show you on, a, I guess, a live format rather than have to go in your HTML code. It shows you what's a H1 tag, what's a H2 tag, and then uh, it also shows you the title tag, description mm -hmm. tag, keyword tag, all on the one page. And then it also shows you alt tags as well on my given page as well. So it's normally good just to see a visual um, overlay of, I guess, the different attributes of your page. I mean, granted, there's also, I don't think it's in here, but um, SEO models actually has a toolbar as well. So not only can you get your links um, or authority scores, it does do various things like highlight your external links, no follow links, and various other things. <coughs> uh, we should have a testing tool. Um, I don't know where to start with this here. Uh, normally, these days, Google's encouraging websites to, um, say, mark up or, um, I guess, tag various inf uh, information on your website. Normally, your address, recipes, event details, uh, and whatnot. And with this tool here, um, it can sort of diagnose if you've done that correctly. Granted, there's a whole help section around this here, and Google normally does give you really good help guides. But what it normally does, if you implement these rich snippets, what they call it, normally you'll get, um, I guess, a better looking search result within the Google itself. So similar to the authorship or where an author comes up, you normally get additional information showing under your, um, your search listing, which I guess can help improve click-through rate. And yeah, I don't think ranking at this point, but just definitely click-through rate, which is worth it in itself. Uh, page, uh, page rank recovery tool. Again, all the URLs available. You normally just put in URL. And what this particular tool does is uh, look at all the links pointing to your website, so it's in conjunction with SEO Mozilla's Open Site Explorer, and we'll then spit out, um, I guess, a bunch of URLs which may be linking from external websites to yours, but because they're 404 ing or going nowhere, it's a wasted or, um, link opportunity. So on the export page, it actually then uh, gives you a whole list of URLs uh, that are currently, currently 404 ing It even gets you um, the code um, to be able to redirect those to another URL. So it actually takes the whole techie part of it out of um, do the process and a copy and paste solution on the export. Um, Jupyter content as well, put your URL in and then actually then will tell, uh, tell you um, if your website has got common um, Jupyter content issues. So is your website able to, do, uh, able to be reached from both www and non-www, which is again normally bad for SEO. Um, do you, uh, can your website be resolved from, say, slash or uh, default.php? Granted, a lot of WordPress sites are quite safe, but this here just diagnoses a few of those issues for you. Just repeat that, what you're saying again, that if you have the prefix of www versus... Uh, normally, um, you need to pick one or the other. Otherwise, you can end up with two versions of your website in search engines, which means you're kind of uh, diluting or duplicating your site. Um, and it's, I guess it's kind of like a wasted link opportunity. It's better to have, I guess, one strong website than sort of two weaker ones. So you need to make a decision. Normally WordPress does it for you when you install it, but you need to pick one or the other. So with WordPress, you're probably fine. It probably does it automatically, but you might just want to check that as well to make sure it can be resolved. Recommended? I think it's personal preference. I like the W, some people don't. I think it just comes down to personal preference, really. I'm a traditionalist. Um, this one here can check um, header issues as well. Granted, it is kind of technically in nature, but see, um, sorry, if you're finding that uh, URLs may be redirecting or if they're breaking or something adverse is uh, happening, you can only just put the URL in, then it would actually um, export. Again, SEO Moz is good on this here. Um, different, say, error codes. Um, and then you can, I guess, once you have the error code itself, um, you can diagnose all the issues. Granted, I don't have a live example here, it's hard to um, explain. But I normally use this here, um, yeah, if it's broken URLs, I'm try to diagnose something weird that's happening on the website. Granted, WordPress normally doesn't have that. Um, examples of do's and don'ts. Um, again, so going back to the others, granted, I've, over 11 years, I've gone from really crap stuff with the, um, with the uh, cloaking earlier on, where it's pretty much just a slab of content, gibberish, put a keyword there, 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 work on keyword density and work, but... These days, focus on quality. Um, granted, Google's released multiple algorithm updates. I can't remember what number Panda up, they're up to, but uh, Google's released specific updates to try to uh, penalise websites with low-quality content. Um, additionally, it's not really good user experience. If people are reading your page or your article and it just sounds like gibberish, you're probably going to go back and find someone else. Uh, focus on building the authority of your websites. Granted, this can be done in many, many ways and probably refer back to Chris's slide about how you can link build, but um, granted, um, don't try cheat search engines, don't get low quality links because with our Algorithm <coughs> updates, it's only normally a matter of time before you do get busted, unless you're into the whole churn and burn thing, but otherwise, stay away from it. I know over a weekend, some of my old websites got hit by the Penguin update and I built those links like a year and a half ago at the start of 2012, so 
it does eventually catch up. So stay away from that there. Um, and again, that probably also links to, say, the low quality services where people are saying, oh, let's see your website for 100 bucks a month. Normally, just uh, common sense dictates that they're not gonna be able to do, uh, get much value out of uh, that kind of budget, especially when it comes to link building. Uh, and be careful of bad SEO, um, do your due diligence. Um, yeah, so I know we've, I mean, there's a lot of uh, sources, which I think is actually the next slide, where you can get information from. Uh, but yeah, just be careful of it, and if you're paying an SEO company, definitely do your research. Um, so yeah, yeah, don't, don't try to trick the search engines, don't do shortcuts. Things that worked back in the day don't really work as much now. Don't rely on old information. I mean, there's still people who tout the keyword tags, um, keyword density, whatnot. Normally these days, that's not the common, um, yeah, you don't really need to look at it that um, closely. And if it feels spammy, it probably is, don't use it. I know I've done a backlink check on a client recently, and there's all these pages hidden in, um, like buried deep in their website, or again, links from unrelated articles. Odds are that's not natural, and that's what Google's going after. I think that went, oh, did I crash it, did I? Oh, there it goes. Sweet. Um, so, checking your progress. Uh, this can be done through many ways. I mean, the main one from YouTube is probably going to mean the most at the end of the day is checking your Google Analytics. Um, probably the most important one at the end of the day is actually uh, looking at how many sales you got, leads, inquiries, whatnot, and then sort of working your way backwards. So, that's going to be your main one anyway. But then work it back, so looking at um, your key metrics, be it around visits, page views, return versus new, time on site, bounce rate, entry and exit pages. I mean, be it from an SEO point of view, the major one um, that you should look at. Um, granted, Google, I think as of today, changed all the report names within Analytics. But it's normally the traffic from organic search, which is going to be, um, I guess, revolve around what you do from an SEO point of view. So, I mean, if you just look at visits, I mean, that can incorporate paid search, social, direct visits. Um, and referral traffic. So normally the major ones look from an SEO point of view is um, organic search. And then you can segment it out by say keyword, landing page, search engine, and uh, you can segment it out different ways there. Uh, then probably the next one you'd want to check out is using a, um, a ranking tool. I know earlier on we asked about who actually uses them, but I, I personally use uh, Advanced Web Ranking. I think they do have a trial product for 30 days or apart from that there. I think you can have unlimited websites. Um, but I think a generic license isn't that much at all. It could be 100 bucks a year or something. So it's not much, and you can run it as often as you want. It is desktop-based, but um, as opposed to some of the other ones, it has a lot of um, reports built into it and can manipulate the data in a lot of different ways. Um, so going back up, Google Analytics, speed it's free, and that's what I use as well. Uh, Google Webmaster Tools, it's normally a great way of um, seeing how Google or search engines themselves actually view your website from an external point of view. So, and it also diagnoses certain issues like um, duplicate uh, tags, short title tags, broken URLs. Um, it's, quite, it's very easy to install and I definitely recommend checking it out. Just even go through each report one by one and um, yeah, see how Google views your website. Uh, additionally, it's also good for launching websites because um, be that you upload an XML sitemap, you can get your website indexed really, really quickly. And yeah, just a couple of other tools, moz.com, which is, say, Open Site Explorer. They also have another range of tools which can sort of give you SEO recommendations. Um, and Raven Tools does very similar things. It can crawl your website and export or give you a report on what you may need to fix. But again, there's so many other tools out there and, yeah, depending on what you actually need it to do, um, yeah, there will be one for you. Uh, where to from here? Yes. Um, so check out uh, Google's official Webmaster Guidelines. Um, if you just Google search that there, you normally find their guidelines and they normally have a lot of links off that uh, given article of what you should do, what you shouldn't do, don't, partici uh, yeah, don't participate in link schemes, focus on the, the user, not the search engine. So definitely start there. In terms of news sources, um, SEO Moz does have a beginner's guide to SEO, which normally does give you those um, say guidelines around say total tag length, description tag length. There's a few cheat sheets as well. So you can view everything on a nice, easy to read format. But there are a lot of those things there. You can probably use it as say, a checklist of things you should cover off and make sure that it's been done when it's a website's live. Um, Search and Land's another good um, SEO news website. And yeah, uh, me and Chris actually run the, oh, I've done it again. Uh, me and Chris also run the Melbourne SEO meetup again. So once a month was last week. Uh, so come along, yeah, uh, chat to us. We know our presentations as well about specifically just about SEO. Um, just to recap, so common issues and fix, uh, fixes, 
I mean, WordPress itself, I think, is great for fixing a lot of um, sort of out of the box um, issues. Granted, there's normally a plugin for everything, and I mean, I wouldn't use it if if it wasn't the case. Um, and again, yeah, there's a plugin for every everything. Uh, tools itself, um, yeah, I mean, we've got the previous slide, but there's a lot of tools out there that can diagnose a whole range of issues, be it on site and off site. Um, the examples of do's and don'ts. Again, focus on the user. Um, don't take shortcuts. In terms of an on-site point of view, uh, content-wise, uh, don't. You can inject the keyword here and there, but make sure it's always readable and I guess provides value to the end user. Uh, don't keyword stuff, which is the common issue where you have stubs of content which don't actually make sense. Like, um, come, uh, come to me for removal of smell, but it doesn't make grammatical sense. So many people still do it. So focus on the end user. In terms of um, say don'ts for link building. You want links that are naturally built. You don't want to, I guess, try game the system because it is only a matter of time before you do get caught. And where to go for more info? I mean, there's a whole, we've listed our SEO Moz, or Moz.com, Search Engine Land. There's a lot of different, um, I guess, news websites out there. Otherwise, I mean, if you ask us a question on the SEO Meetup page, or I'm sure if you're this page is here as well, we're happy to help. And I guess that's questions now. Yeah, thanks, Michael. So thanks everyone. Uh, first of all, we've got time, Dave, for some questions. Okay, yeah. So, okay, go for it. <laughs> It's one that I see a lot. It's one I, I hear a lot. I would say it depends. Um, you know, the safe answer it depends. But um, really, if it, you know, there might be other options for them, maybe to write content on, you know, for other sites, for example, rather than maintaining their own blog. Yeah, for, from an um, I guess an SEO point of view. I'll grab that off here. Yeah, from an SEO point of view, the only um, I mean, if you're going to put up a blog and publish content, the only reason why I'd say to do that is that even if you're doing it from an SEO point of view and you're trying to create content based on, say, keyword research. Uh, alternatively, if you're trying to do it for, I guess, link bait or create engaging content, publishing content for the sake of um, just publishing it, is, yeah, there's no use in it. I know back in the day, what you do is you create like an article or a blog post and then use it to, say, cross-link or promote another internal page. There's not much value in it these days. I mean, the value comes from having other websites normally linking to your website. So I guess that comes into, say, um, guest blogging or content marketing, but Blogging for a safer blogging normally doesn't have much value because no one's going to see the content if it's not, I guess, SEO friendly or have an SEO purpose, or if it's not engaging and not getting promoted through social channels, why not? So, yeah, it needs to be done well. I think people get carried away with the idea that you know the bloggers you know get all the traffic and they do, but a lot of really good bloggers create really good content. So, yeah, that's. Well, could I maybe um, make? I think the, the, was the content needs to be more regularly updated for Google to sure. pay more attention. That's a, that's a common thing that will suggest, but even if you just, the actual pages that do exist already, to review the content on there, and if they really want to get top one, go and maybe employ someone who's an author or a writer, and yeah, maybe just work on that. To, but then, yeah, obviously the other side of it is then getting high quality links back to it, yeah. which will... Yeah, they, they, they do, um, a lot of people do think that just having fresh content being re released all the time, there's a bit of a misconception they think that, that Google likes that. But yeah, it's I'm, still got to be good stuff. There's so, so much that goes into Google, I guess the algorithm. Yeah. There's so much that goes into the algorithm, I don't think just pushing content on the site itself is going to really make much of a difference, say, if it hasn't got authority links coming in. Um, and without standing on maybe some SEO people's toes here, it might be just a way of actually uh, providing, I guess, more service to that client. So they're probably just trying to get more money out of them. <laughs> Up the back. Um, you mentioned that keywords aren't really that important these days. Yeah, keywords, tags, yes. Yeah, yeah. so when you're setting up the EOS stuff, if you're in a plugin, should you pay a lot of, spend a lot of time? So it's, it's a different, uh, the, so what they sort of, Yoast asks, um, is it a what's your focus keyword? So as opposed to the keyword meta tag. Yeah, I mean, in terms asking. of the keywords meta tag, I mean, Google said that they haven't supported it since about 2008, and I'd say that um, Bing itself it doesn't use it anymore. I mean, I think I actually put it in maybe the 
the site clinic I did actually only last week, not to use keyword tags. I definitely recommend still doing the whole keyword research and making sure your keywords in the title tag because that's, I guess, an algorithm, um, I guess, metric or Google uses that. And description tag because I guess it's important for click through rate. And also, if your keywords in the your search result actually does get bolded. So, I do recommend there, but the keyword tag doesn't have SEO value. Uh, I think they've identified as, say, a poison tag where it has no value, but it can, say, um, hurt your website. And your competitors can also see yeah, what you're targeting. It's the easiest way to see what uh, you're trying to rank for as well, if you check it from yeah. the yeah, competitive point of view. Like that, um, was it Screaming Frog? You run by the crush of competitors' website, you can actually export the entire sort of keyword portfolio if, people, if they were using yeah. the keyword tag. But that's different from Yoast's keyword uh, feature. Yeah. So should we just not use that tag at all? Delete, empty it. Remove it, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's what I recommend to clients. So I say just to remove it altogether. Yeah, has, has no value. You're only wasting your time populating it. Yeah. So a lot of old information out there still says you know use keyword tag, and that that's why it's um, you know it's important to sort of keep up with with things, and it hasn't been used for a long time. And I think when usually when you see it, it's usually a sign that uh, you can sort of see what keywords they're actually targeting. Yeah. It has no value for to the search engine. So, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about meta description and how meta descriptions can help summarise the web page. Or... No, sure, yeah, sure. Yeah, I don't mind. Yeah, so in terms of a meta description tag, it isn't uh, necessarily used for SEO ranking. So if you put keywords in it, Google doesn't, um, I'll say, give you a um, ranking improvement or whatnot. But I guess it's similar to, say, AdWords. It's kind of your snippet or your little bit of promotional content that you can control and, I guess, use to um, try to attract as many people as possible to come through the door. So I guess it's really just a, promo a promotional little snippet of content that you want to use to get people in from the search results. So it's not really meant to just be keyword stuff if you've chosen keywords, it's meant to get people in. So granted that Google doesn't actually give you ranking preference if you got it, uh, if, sorry, if you got a keyword in there or not, it should be used <coughs> simply as a promotional sort of snippet to get people in. If you, if you leave it empty, it gets filled. Um, yeah, yeah, you, you, you definitely need to fill it out. Um, if you, yeah, like what Peter was about to say, <laughs> if oh, you want to no, say it. Only, I was just going to say, if you don't do anything with it, um, it can just, you know, Google just fills it out by default. So it'll just go searching the first text that it finds on your site and fill it full. So it could say things like, you know, it could have, um, fill it full of your menu items or something. So you go to those pages on Google and it says, Google de Gook, and you ain't going to click on that. Yeah. So, that's another WordPress site. Yeah, that's another WordPress site. Yeah, yeah there's, so go through, set it all up, and yeah. so you want something that's an incentive to try and entice people to to click to click through. Yep. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I used that particular um, function two days ago when I actually relaunched a new website. Uh, within two days, like 100 and something URLs are actually um, indexed by Google. So it does listen to that particular directive. Um, as to why you're... Your site map, your how, site how many... Map tells you how many you submitted and how many have been indexed. Yeah. I don't think it really reflects as such because I think as soon as you upload um, an XML sitemap, those fields get populated regardless. So I think it tells you how many are already in the index and how many, um, I guess, are in your XML sitemap. I, I don't think the two actually are kind of will correlate with each other. Or if you do one, it doesn't update the other, but it definitely helps. I mean, if you, if you like, um, upload an XML sitemap or you submit it and then you do that fetch by Google, I think the two uh, work hand in hand and can definitely improve. Uh, it's, yeah, but you're not Absolutely. alone. I've, I've seen that before. So it's, you know, sometimes these things are hit and miss and you have to sort of get in there and... Because there's a lot of custom posts in this particular thing that I've used. Mm -hmm. Are they... Is there... Could be doing something funky with it. Yeah, Maybe. So just, yeah, it's one of those big index. Yeah, I mean, send it to so us and we'll take a look if I'm you want. I'm just wondering if it's the, the things are a bit... Like, Maybe. And, and yep. those. How many pages do you have on your site? Is it like hundreds or oh, dozens? It's not, it's not, it's not Okay. It's maybe about 50, like okay. Or, you know, <coughs> and yep. then the other mistake I made was I, um, I allowed all the tags and categories and everything. So that's, yep. that's all been indexed. Okay, so but you can you text. can turn it off though. So it's the good thing is you can, can you can chat absolutely. So, so do I need to go through and manually delete every single URL? Is, is that, uh, is that no. So I think what you do is you just um, your site map would be resubmitted with more to reflect the changes you've made. 
So, um, yep. Yeah. And and you yeah. can actually like a lot of the things, even bad stuff, you can reverse. So I mean, you you. Yeah, I mean, in terms of say, if you have enabled say tag pages, category pages get indexed. Normally, if, say if you're all in one SEO, normally you just tick that you don't want it to be indexed anymore, and then the next time Google come through, we'll just remove from index. Additionally, with most XML sitemap plugins as well, you can, um, I guess, click if you want them to be part of the XML sitemap. So you can tell Google what you do and don't want to be indexed. I mean, as per your question of like some URLs are, um, are and aren't, send it to me and Chris and we'll just have a look and see. We'll send us the URL of your site and maybe some uh, URLs that aren't indexed and then you can probably diagnose to see if there's any kind of te uh, technical limitations of what's going on. <coughs> Uh, so you want to know for a specific keyword what is your ranking? Right. So yeah, a lot of those tools. So um, Michael went through. So um, events they actually ranking. give you keyword ranking and a bit AWR. Yeah. So yeah, events web ranking. You can run as often as you like, and it will give you trending over time as well. So you can see it on a daily basis, a weekly basis, and see how all your keywords or an individual keyword has actually trended over time. So again. When there's an algorithm update, you can kind of see before and after that update and see how your site has been impacted and kind of reverse engineer what may have happened. A lot of, a lot of the good tools as well will give you things like what's the search volume on those keywords. Mm -hmm. So you can tell, I mean, what's the point ranking for one that's got no search volume, that sort of thing. So it's, so, worth, it's worth getting into some of those tools. So not only can it do sort of keyword based, keyword basis, I mean, it categorizes in different ways. Like we'll show you um, how many page ones you may have for that keyword set. And it can visualise the data in many, many different ways. And might I think AWR also has their own sort of um, what's called our visibility score. So I mean, you can manipulate the data in a lot of ways, and very yeah, run it as often as you like. And again, I think it's a 30-day trial at the beginning to at least use it. And if you like it, just buy a license. Right, you've said that, uh, there is a lot of hardware you work with on any uh, website. Yep. So. What is the, like, if you need to work on the website, is it uh, set and forget for one time, or can you summarize the steps that uh, needed to have uh, to on the website? Yeah. Yeah, because, uh, sorry, can you change, uh, keep on changing the tags and meta tags and all that, so... I mean, I personally wouldn't really uh, change it that often. I mean, maybe a description tag, yes, because it's not going to really fluctuate your rankings, and maybe you want to promote a sale or a particular event. As per, say, the title tags, I probably would have recommend changing them too much because normally, I mean, my SEO method I normally do is I do keyword research and then I kind of map keywords to a given page. So normally, um, I'm already kind of, I guess, not stuffed, but I've um, kind of jam-packed them full of all the different keywords. So I probably haven't got too much, um, I guess, room to move. Um, I mean, if it comes to, say, changing title tags, I mean, I'd probably even, if you want to go after more keywords, I recommend uh, recommending add more pages. Mm. But normally... So, so creating content... Keyword research, looking at analytics, um, using some of those tools, even a fraction of them, would could keep you busy all day, every day. So. Because I think is a, a SEO is not a solo flight. You cannot do everything on the road because you Correct. need a lot of uh, yep. other people to work with, uh, yep. making the website on the top rank. Yep. I mean, a lot of the SEO stuff is not really set and forget. I mean, after you've done a lot of on-site stuff and the technical stuff, I mean, you still have to monitor that stuff doesn't go AWOL and you get a whole bunch of broken links. But I mean, a lot of on-site stuff is kind of like a, um, you do a lot of stuff at the beginning and then you kind of maintain or um, review it every now and again. I mean, the value after those initial steps comes from building links to your website or adding new pages. Personally, I prefer the plugin because it's easy to use. Um, and usually, it, if you're using a, a good, um, high-quality theme, it, it will the theme will let you use a plugin. So, if you depending on the quality of your theme, uh, but sometimes you do get some funky things when you've got competing things that are you know plugins and theme trying to do the same thing. Um, it, I think the best thing to do is you do a little bit of um, uh, you know analysis and diagnosis to make sure everything's the way it should. But I, I personally like Yoast myself um, and use it. And sometimes if I'm not using WordPress, um, I'll use other things or do it manually. So yeah. it sort of some, depends. Some of the on-site 
Some of the on-site principles of SEO haven't changed for many years, um, been the same for a long time, but what you do on your site to, um, to keep, um, make it as easy as possible for Google to index your site and, and um, make it display properly. So you, it's arguable you could use Genesis, whatever's built in, or you could just not use anything and do your own, dive into the code and do it all yourself. I don't know, it, but um, it, I like using Yoast because it is a real visual guide and keeps you just on track. Michael uses um, all in one, and I used to use that as well. So, yeah, um, yeah normally I don't use the built in, um, say, functionality of a, or a theme itself for an SEO just because it normally doesn't have the flexibility of a comprehension or comprehensiveness of what a normal plugin does. Like, I mean, a lot of the stuff normally only covers, say, title and description tags. I mean, it doesn't, say, give you the option to block various parts of your website. Same thing around canonical tags and also permalinks and that. It normally just doesn't have the flexibility or comprehensiveness that, um, say, the standalone plugin actually has. I'll let you go, Chris. <laughs> Last one. <laughs> Can we do two more, Dee? Okay. okay, you're next. Oh, next. Sorry, because I've had hand up. Go for it. Yeah, can I ask two questions, please? <laughs> <laughs> no, you stole it. <laughs> it's cheeky. Uh, the impacts of applying, uh, say, uh, taking a Google ad quality, does that help in your search ranking? And secondly, um, what about the impacts of uh, having a Google account and linking that into your search engine ranking? So you end up with a photograph beside your... Uh, okay. I think the thought and thinking is well, authorship. Um, and that's the type of, you know, Google is adding more data to, to their results. And um, I think the thinking is that people are more likely to click on these things. So uh, there's a lot of tests and a lot of debate. And uh, I would say that it, it, those results do stand out. I know that when I'm researching something, if I'm looking for, for example, someone's opinion on something, you know, if I see a blog, I know that it's a person that's written something. So um, it depends. But there's all, I would say, uh, to follow those sorts of best practices. If Google is recommending them, um, it's a pretty good indication that especially their, you know, um, Google Plus and um, other social things, they might not be using it to to rank right now, but it's definitely, it does influence, um, I, I think there's some influence there, but go for it. Um, first question, no, AdWords doesn't have an impact on SEO rankings, but it can be used, say, um, at the beginning of a, launching a website, you can see how various, um, say, keywords or traffic actually responds when it goes to your website. So it might be a way of, I guess, acquiring quick traffic to kind of, yeah, test how your website actually works until you may get the same kind of traffic through organic. Um, second part, I think it was only one or two weeks ago, Google said uh, that authorship isn't currently a ranking, um, I guess, metric in its algorithm. But I guess having your face in the search engines can improve your click-through rate, I guess, as opposed to a listing that doesn't have it. And, I mean, a lot of the people think it's definitely going to be a future algorithm, um, have impact on future algorithms, I guess, be it around the fact that Google will look at um, who wrote a piece of content, how, I guess, um, the other pieces of content have gone from a social point of view, look at how active you are in Google+. I mean, I think they're going to collect a lot more information and definitely in the future will be used a lot more. Yep. But it, even in the meantime, it doesn't take long to set up and, um, yeah, it can improve your click-through rate. So, last one. Yep, uh, thanks. Last one. Uh, we talked a lot about keyword research. Um, with the safe search changes that came through a couple of weeks ago, as I understand it from looking at my analytics account, we're not seeing the keyword data coming through. Are there any good ways you can suggest, obviously, at a limited time to actually then start validating how pages are performing for certain keywords? Mm, that's a that's a good one, yeah. And it's got a lot of people upset because they can't see. Um, you go into analytics and you just can't see what the keywords were people searched for um, anymore at all. Um, so, but there are other ways you can still kind of get that. Um, obviously. Um, if you've got an AdWords account, you can see keyword data in there. Also, Google Keyword Tool, um, sorry, Google, um, Webmaster Tools, Google Webmaster Tools. You can go in there and see a bit of data about what people are searching for as well. Uh, but there, yeah, I want to elaborate. Yeah, yeah I mean, there is the, uh, the report in um, Google Webmaster Tools. It's not that accurate. I mean, it, it seems to be like really, really rounded figures. I mean, you can, you can see how things are tracked over time, but I wouldn't use those numbers as, as gospel. Um, I mean, granted, I think it's up to about 90% now. I mean, the common, what we used to do back when it was like 20%, we used to look at the ratio between, say, generic keywords, I guess your products versus your branded search, and then we might multiply that ratio out versus that hidden part. 
Um, what I personally do, I, I look at things that maybe on a URL by URL basis, because you can still track what page of a website it's gone to, and then maybe type out any of your ranking reports. So if a keyword's sort of gone up, gone down, you can then probably cross-check that versus, say, what, um, what URLs have attracted, I guess, organic search traffic, and then kind of, I guess, determine maybe what's had that impact. I mean, it, it, is, it does make it a lot harder, and I know that um, our clients have kind of, yeah, their hair out over it, because it makes it a lot harder to attribute sales to specific channels. But um, yeah, maybe that's where if you can't get that particular data, start looking at um, yeah, ranking data as maybe a backup and maybe tie it in with webmaster tools. It's a hot topic. Yeah, I mean, it's, yeah. I think there's a website um, not provided count and it actually tracks it on a week by week basis um, to see how like the average of what not provided is these days. But I mean, it's across all um, all platforms. So it's kind of just the way it's going. Yep. Cool. Okay. Thanks.